Ryan Glover. Frida Hardich. Present. Russell McMurray. Present. Al Pond. Present. Catherine Powers. Present. Thomas Worthy. We have 10 board members. 10 board members. All right, first uh, item on the agenda, the minutes. I'd ask for a motion and a second for the minute approval. I move to approve this is Hardich. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Mr. Uh, Chairman Pond uh, of uh, pilot program. Uh, the electric bus pilot program was a uh, that you see in front of you, CTE, which is the organization that does a lot of the analytics to um, assess the uh, application of electric technology on, on transit routes. New Flyer, who is the manufacturer of uh, the electric buses, Siemens, and we'll be talking about the technology that they provide uh, in the rest of this um, presentation. And then, of course, our partner, Georgia Power, who uh, will provide the, the uh, installation of the equipment and, of course, the power to, to uh, charge the system. So we have, uh, in previous um, presentations to the board, we received approval to move forward with the analysis uh, done by CTE. And as well as the uh, procurement of the buses through New Flyer. Now we're here to talk about the next step, which is the supplemental support equipment. Next slide, please. So the program is to uh, pilot the use of six electric buses. And through the analysis, it was determined that it would be uh, for Route 2, which is interlined with Route 102 that there would be chargers installed at both Laredo and Hamilton, as well as an on-route charger at the Edgewood Candler Park station. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that will work in just a moment. Next slide, please. So there are many benefits uh, to using electric buses. One, of course, is the diversification of our fuel sources so that uh, we um, no matter what happens in the uh, in the propulsion industry, that we are agile and that we have uh, multiple choices for continuing our service and running our fleet. Of course, electric vehicles uh, have greatly reduced emissions. They're much quieter. They're a simpler technology, so maintenance uh, on them is uh, a little bit easier to perform. And of course, they're, they're, uh, when they were first introduced, there was some concern about reliability, but they have now been a proven technology and are being adopted uh, throughout the country and, and the world. Next slide, please. There are two types of charging uh, opportunities and requirements. The one is the depot chargers, where the vehicles will be uh, domiciled overnight and will receive uh, their main charge. But then uh, due to weather conditions, due to uh, stop and go traffic, due to uh, the use of uh, air conditioning, stop and go traffic, many different things, of course, consume uh, the charge while the bus is operating. And so to uh, ensure that we always have sufficient charge for the bus to be able to complete its full round uh, during the day, uh, there is the capability of doing in route charging. Uh, you can see the equipment on the right is the pantograph, which drops a uh, connection down to the top of the bus to perform that charging while the bus is um, in a, uh, a waiting period. Next slide, please. So in front of you, you see the list of the different pieces of equipment that would be uh, acquired from Siemens uh, should you approve this resolution. Next slide, please. In addition to the equipment that we are acquiring, uh, I wanted to point out that they will uh, be providing equipment and services, but Georgia Power will actually perform the installation. Uh, the equipment is being purchased with uh, local funds. Because of the unique nature of this, um, there is no DBE requirement. Uh, audit is finishing up um, 
their review of the, uh, the cost information. They've been contacting other uh, organizations uh, to confirm uh, that the price is fair and reasonable. And the, the feedback we've gotten so far is that uh, it appears that it's going to be just fine. Uh, and then, of course, the um, equipment is, is uh, being manufactured in, in North Carolina and being assembled here in Georgia. Next slide, please. Uh, the services that we've requested uh, to be part of this uh, include um, uh, a lot of data monitoring and reporting. Uh, we want to be able to see how the vehicles perform under different weather conditions, un under different loads. Uh, we want to see what the wear and tear on the batteries are, what, what does the battery life look like uh, over time. Because again, as this is a pilot, we want to have all the information we need to make a good decision uh, as to whether we move forward with additional uh, electric vehicles and, and uh, how we would use them in our fleet. There is a two-year warranty that is included uh, with this. There's also the on-site commissioning and testing. Uh, one round of that uh, would be included. Um, as well as inspection and factory acceptance testing. One of the critical components of this is the training of our personnel to ensure that they know everything they need to know about maintaining uh, this new technology. Next slide, please. We have some options in the contract. Um, the uh, First one of which would be a second factory acceptance visit. Uh, if we felt that there was uh, something that we wanted to be inspected further, we would, we would bring them back in to be able to do that. Uh, we, also are, um, uh, we also have the option of uh, cloud services, which would allow the uh, data uh, to be populated and retrieved um, more uh, in a different fashion than uh, the traditional kind of hard reporting of data. And then there is an additional warranty that is available to us. Next slide, please. And so, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, members of the, uh, of the capital and program, uh, I'm sorry, planning and capital programs committee, uh, I respectfully uh, request the approval of the resolution for procurement of the Siemens equipment and services as presented. The contract amount would be $978,036. And I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'll move approval, Al. Jim. Need a second? I second. This is Hardage. Okay. Uh, Jim Derrick made the motion. Hardage seconded. Uh, okay. Are there any uh, questions for uh, Ms. Bomar? Hey, this is Chris Tomlinson. I have a question. Yes, sir. Hey, Marsha, uh, when you were speaking about training of uh, MARTA staff, are you are you looking at them maintaining vehicles as well as the charging infrastructure? At this time, yes. Okay. All right, and we'll, um, since Georgia Power is going to do the install and the infrastructure, will they be the ones that are providing training to the, I guess, MARTA electrical staff? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I will have to find that out. I'm not sure. I, I, um, uh, I know Siemens is providing the base training. I don't know if there'll be supplemental training uh, by Georgia Power, but I will find out and get back to you on that. All right. Thank you. Are this is Roberta to... with a question. Go ahead, Ms. Long. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Marsha, I wanted to find out whether or not you have an uh, of, I guess a, a plan for training the, the, mo the mechanics for the upkeep of the uh, these buses. Will yes, we be able to use the same people? Yes, ma'am. The um, uh, the training that will be provided will be for our existing uh, support now, what staff, the hell? our existing support staff uh, to be able to maintain these vehicles. Okay, and what's the shelf life? About how long do we estimate the, these buses to last in service? So we would expect them to last as long as any other bus that we have in our fleet. Um, so the uh, uh, 
the cycle, the, the replacement cycle for these um, are projected to be uh, similar to the existing technology. Um, but that is also part of this pilot test to see if the technology proves out to uh, perform as, uh, as uh, described in the literature, if you will. So would that be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? I guess I don't know Mar what the Marcia, existing one is. Marcia, the existing ones, um, uh, the, the planned life cycle is about 12 years for an existing okay. budget, and that, that's what we hope to uh, achieve with these. Right. Thank All you. right. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Pond. You're welcome. Yes. I have a question. Go ahead, Ms. Scott. Uh, yes. Uh, I believe you mentioned there was a two year warranty with the availability to purchase additional an additional warranty. Yes, ma'am. So the, we do have that option built into the contract and the decision will be made uh, based on performance as to whether that is exercised. So would you have to make that decision prior to the end of the two years at the beginning or when would that be necessary? And what is the length of time for the additional warranty? So the, um, uh, I don't know the, the extent, but it would, it would have to be exercised before the end of the first warranty. And then that would be um, uh, so there would be no break in the in the warranty period. But I'll have to get back to you on the uh, the duration of that. Us. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, if not, I will call the question. Are there any no votes? Are there any abstentions? Uh, the resolution passed. Thank you very much. The next uh, item is a resolution for solicitation of proposals for fabrication and installation of the mosaic wall at the Atlanta Airport Station. Uh, the presenter will be Catherine Durger. Okay, try it again. <laughs> Good morning, Chairman Bond, members of the committee, and Parker. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm here before representing the Office of Art and Transit this morning to fabricate and install a large Catherine, try, try turning your uh, your uh, video off, and you might get better. Um, you're really breaking up. But you can hear them. Okay. Uh, morning, I'm the office approval Catherine, for the are you, solicitation. Are you speaking through your computer? No, I'm on my headphones. Should I, take, should I try to do the computer itself? Maybe. No, you, you sound great now. Oh. Yeah. Only when I'm not presenting. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, how's that? That's better? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Here I go. All right. You all heard the introduction twice now, hopefully. Not really. Okay, let me start over. 
Good morning, Chairman Pond, Co-Chair Floyd, members of the committee, and Mr. Parker. I'm Catherine Durga. I'm before you representing the Office of Art and Transit to request approval for the solicitation of proposals to fabricate and install a large mosaic artwork at the airport station with the estimated eventual contract amount of 450000 And if we could go to the next slide. Awesome. Um, as you may know, Art in Transit put out a call for artists in the last part of last year. Uh, we received over 250 entries from the state, the nation, um, some from international destinations, and convened a selection panel of local arts community leaders who shortlisted those entries into 10 uh, really phenomenal artists and chose local artist Michael Jones. And so what you see here is a portion of his painting that he's working on. The intention all along was to um, tap an artist to create a two-dimensional work, so either a painting or some kind of collage, that would then be translated into mosaic for the purposes of this artwork at, mosaic, at um, airport station. And so next slide, please. Right, and here is the site that it, where the piece will go in the airport. And so, um, you know, this is just, keep in mind, a blown up piece of one portion of the artwork. So this is not exactly what you would see, but it's a massive site. It's 15 feet high and 70 feet wide. Um, and it comes at a decision point, a decision point for our customers. So they will be exiting the fare gates here. They'll be determining, are they going to North or South terminal? And it really provides what we hope is either kind of a, um, a welcome mat to the world or, you know, kind of a farewell from Atlanta as people leave to the um, go out on their trips. Um, and so what we want here is something very significant, very impactful, something that really feels representative of Atlanta. And um, that is why we chose to do this in Mosaic. Um, if we could go to the next slide here. So why mosaic? Well, we have a customer focal point here, right? It's very, very. Um, it's going to be a very visible part of the station. Upgrades going on to the overall station, so we want this artwork to feel of a piece with those upgrades to be an upgrade as well. Um, we want to have an artwork that feels permanent, more so than a mural. We could just have Michael paint on the wall, but this will feel like a much more permanent piece. Um, and then. Also, Mosaic has an extremely high durability. I've included this photo just for fun. This is a picture of the largest intact Roman mosaic, and so thousands of years old. And it was recently, well, 10 years ago discovered, but recently opened to, to the public in Turkey, where it was discovered while people were ex excavating for a new hotel. So what you see here are these ripples that were formed um, through earthquakes that the mosaic experienced. So the mosaic literally kept the floor together. <laughs> and it's an incredibly durable substance, in other words, and it's extremely easy to maintain. So it's one of the you know preferred materials for train stations. And when you have the airport, which is also a very high vibration environment coupled with a subway, a train station, an elevated train station, we're going to be experiencing a lot of vibration. And so for those reasons, we felt mosaic was um, a great choice here and that it will be highly impactful and a beautiful addition to MARTA's art collection. So for those reasons, um, we are requesting approval to solicit proposals to engage a firm to build and install this mosaic at the airport station. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you, Catherine. I'd like to ask for a motion in the second, please. Boy, I move approval of this. <laughs> Thank you. That's from Jim Durrett. Do I have a second? This is free to a second. Okay. All right. Durrett made the motion. Free to hard is seconded. Uh, questions for the uh, board? No, but this is free to hard. This, I just want to say how lovely this project looks. So I'm very excited to see this. Thank you. Yeah, it is very exciting. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, will, will any of this uh, installation be fronted by breeze card machines or something that really interrupts the totality of the work of art? Um, no, it should not be 
<clears throat> excuse me, it should, there should not be any blockage to it. I understand the smart carts are moving and the breeze card machines should be, they're going to be moved as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Catherine, this, this is Rod Friars and I have a question. Uh, is this uh is this mosaic the picture that we're looking at? This is the uh this is the approved mosaic that will go up. Is that correct? This is one portion of it. So what you All see right. here is is actually a little bit stretched just to fill this space in the photo that I had. So it, the later, um, but this is this is a portion of the actual painting, um, okay. and the later piece is a, is a little more complex, has more stuff in it. Okay, and will will this just be on the wall? Is this going to go anywhere else, like in the, the ceiling or any other place? Is that if the mm, places? No, place? no, actually, it'll just be on this wall. Um, which, I believe this wall was originally intended when it when the station was built for as you know, sort of the art site, and so that's the wall we're going to be activating. We hope later to move up to the platform and potentially do some nice things up there as well. Up right okay, now, that's okay. Can wonderful. I think it, I think it's going to be wonderful once it gets completed. I've seen the ones that they did in New York, and uh, they mm. were beautiful, and they were done on the ceiling. Uh, yeah. and so the, the mosaic design is is beautiful. So I look forward to seeing it being implemented. Thank you. Thank thank you, Catherine. If you shared this and I missed it, I apologize. When mm. will when would it be complete? Ah, uh, so I think we're we're looking to install this concurrent with the airport renovation being complete. Um, just to kind of avoid having, you know, having the potential for it to get dusty during the renovation, have to keep it clean and everything during that. And then also we sort of want to open it all at once to do a ta-da, you know. So um, I think that if it had, if it started tomorrow or from execution, let's call it, I would say around eight to nine months after notice to proceed. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Durr, Durr, um I would think, you know, with airport construction going on, it'll probably be closer to somewhere in the 23 calendar year um, mm -hmm. because the airport construction is quite, it's a, it's a redo of the entire station while maintaining traffic through the station. Right. So a lot of phasing will be required to do it. So I think you see the whole thing coming together within, within the next two years. Thanks, Frank. Any other questions for Catherine? Not, I'll call the question. Are there any uh, no votes? Are there any abstention votes? Uh, the motion passes. The next item on the agenda is a resolution for the award of a contract for a for the Beltline light rail study to be presented by Larry Prescott. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Good afternoon, Chairman Pond, uh, Co-Chair Floyd, committee members, and Mr. Parker. Uh, the Atlanta Streetcar Project will, was kicked off uh, with the LRT connectivity in downtown Atlanta. And since then, we've started the extension east in coordination with Atlanta Beltline, Inc. As stated, I'm Larry Prescott, the AGM of Infrastructure, and the Capital Programs Delivery Team would like to ask for your, your approval for the award of the consultant services for the Beltline LRT East Extension Concept Feasibility Study, P48439. Next slide, please. So we've identified a need to hire a firm to provide a concept validation and feasibility review study for the future extension of the streetcar east beyond the current project to the north and the south. We will be covering today the current project status, the study scope, and the timeline and costs. Next slide, please. So starting off with the current streetcar extension east, the existing Atlanta streetcars, the gray dashed line, the A1 line on, in the center there, lower left. The blue is the extension, proposed extension now, that runs from the Jackson Edgewood area over to the Atlanta Beltline on the east and then runs up to the Pont City Market area. We're in the planning phase right now, which led us to the review of the Atlanta Beltline environmental documents. Next step, please. This map shows the Atlanta Beltline NEPA study area. The Atlanta streetcar is the purple in the, in the lower middle there. So it, it may be hard to see, but the, the environmental document is, it doesn't quite make it all the way up to the Lindbergh station. 
It's also dated a little bit. The, it was started with an EA back in 2013 and the it changed to category exclusion in 2016. During our review of the NEPA document though, it became quite evident that there were several areas of transit design gaps, which warranted further investigation. And as we are going to take ownership of this, and as well as the associated risk, we thought that the, the study, this study was definitely warranted. The current study was also trail based with some real consideration, but it avoided several areas of concern in order to have a successful FDA approval for the trail program. Uh, one example that we found right off the bat, uh, the green highlight there in, in the upper middle there, that's Piedmont Park. Right now, the trail program for ABI transitions underneath the Virginia Avenue viaduct up to an at-grade crossing at Monroe and 10th Street and crosses over into Piedmont Park through the park tavern parking lot. So ABI owns that parking lot and if we have to transition rail through there, we're gonna take out that parking lot and they're gonna to have to find other parking right now. So this is good for trails, but not necessarily good for rails. Next slide, please. So the environment documents, you know, were only done in portions of the alignment. As I said, we're missing that the transit station is the transit station connection. The transit gaps in the northern section uh, between Ansley Mall and Lindbergh Station are pretty evident, and the southern end between the existing streetcar and I-20 uh, start showing up a lot of gaps that we're going to go through here. Next slide. So in this one, we're starting at the northern end, the orange dash running up along the blue line there. The blue line is actually our red line, Marta. The, the orange dash is the proposed alignment. Technically, we're trying to tie into the Lindbergh station on the northern end and keeping in mind the proposed Clifton Quarter coming in right above the armor yard, which is the green roof structure there kind of in the middle. We also have the armor yard has two tail tracks, a Y tracks connecting to the red line. And then we also have to consider the right of way impacts we have Passion City up near our annex, as well as the armor community going down. All of these need to be reviewed further for our LRT viability. And then we have the existing abandoned railroad tunnel uh, underneath I-85 and Buford Highway on the lower section there that used to connect to, to the railroad corridor on the west side. Next slide. So dropping down to a street level, so to speak, uh, the left uh, picture there, that's the existing tunnel underneath 85, you can see it there. And the 180 degree turnaround on the right side is looking where the railroad path used to go and connect to the railroad on the west side of our red line. The red line is that aerial structure above us in this view. So due to that uh, conflict with the railroad, our line would have to do a shift to the right, that blue kind of path around the red line and the abutments going to the east side of the, the red, uh, red line march station. So as you can see, uh, we have a conflict there with the railroad and if you Heard recently, Atlanta Beltline Inc., their path went through the southern tunnel that came out in the Armour Yard community. They had to redo their entire alignment because of total conflicts with CSX. So they would not allow them to, to cross their, their right-of-way lines. Next slide, please. All right, shifting to the southern end, uh, several studies have been done, conducted, around the entire area to try to tackle the east-west uh, dividing line of the MARTA rail lines, the blue and the green line, the Holsey Yard and CSX tracks. On the left side, the orange dash is an, an alternate that ran through the MLK station area. And then in the center, there have been options of looking at a tunnel and or utilizing the Crog Street tunnel to get underneath the railroads. And then the orange line going to the far upper right it has not been looked at as far as a connection to the Edgewood Candler or Inman Park Reynolds Town stations. So one of the things we need to do is, is kind of take all these and combine them into one uh, total package, so to speak, and understand what's going on LRT wise. So next slide, please. We'll shift down to street level once again. 
And this is a view looking south from Crog Street. The blue and green line is the aerial structure up above. The CSX line runs over the Crog Street tunnel uh, right, right in front of us. So no LRT viability has been validated in these, in these studies, just options. Next slide, please. So in order to uh, better understand the transit gaps, we decided this feasibility study was warranted. Also, due to the amount of consultants who have worked for both MARTA and ABI over the years, we've decided to do a solicitation of an RFP to two independent consultants that are not have not been working with us locally. And we, we chose HDR and BHB. But due to the specialty services and the quick timeline and the desire for an unbiased review, we, we have not required any DBE participation for this one. After review and negotiations this past week, we've selected BHB to be that consultant for us. The scope developed includes these areas here, uh, starting off with the you know, ABI and other data, existing data uh, coordination and review. Then the assessment will review both the environmental and the LRT design feasibility and further design or define the transit gaps for the full transit connections that I talked about station and station options. And then the screening will focus on comparing the LRT needs and the risk associated with those design gaps. And then finally, the feasibility study will document the findings and recommendations for in a format that can be used for future planning, public involvement, and design. Next slide, please. So looking at the, the timeline here, this proposed six month duration of this feasibility study falls right in the middle of the planning study we're currently doing. And this allows us to utilize this information as far as the conclusion of the planning and moving into the design phase. So in conclusion, we're requesting your approval of the consultant services for the concept feasibility study, utilizing BHB as our consultant for a cost, a project cost of $500,000. Next slide, please. And I'll open any questions that you may have. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Larry. Uh, before we have any discussion, I'd like to have a motion on the second, please. I'll move approval, Jim. I'll second. Frierson. Okay, do it. Uh, motions for approval. Frierson second. Uh, are there any questions for Mr. Prescott? Let me ask a quick question first, uh, Larry. You mentioned yes, uh, no, no DBE, but isn't uh, BHP the, a minority firm? Uh, Brentley Peters. They they okay. are yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is Rod Frierson, Larry. So uh, you mentioned that there were other consultants uh, with MARTA in the past who have previously looked at this type of concept of doing this. Is that right? As, as part of the streetcar first? program. Oh, okay. As part of the streetcar overall program, the whole 22 miles. And the consultants have worked for both MARTA and Atlanta Beltline, Inc. over the years. The, this program has been around for 15 years or more. Okay, okay. And so this, uh, this consultant now will look at it in terms of us taking it a step further. We're not losing anything from what has already happened in the past, that understanding. Correct, exactly. Yeah. All the, we're providing them all of our data as well as all the existing ABI data. And, okay. and the two consultants we did were, were not based here, but have Northern uh, rail experience. And so mm -hmm. using other uh, agency experience to come in and do similar type studies here. Okay, thank you. Uh, Al, I just want to say that I think this is a, a really important step that needs to be taken for independent analysis of the feasibility of uh, putting light rail on this part or uh, in the future, any expansion of light rail on the belt line. So I, I commend us for spending this money to uh, have this analysis done. Okay. Good point. Are there any other uh, questions for Mr. Prescott? Hi, Mr. Pond. I have a quick question. Go ahead, Chairman Scott. Do we have a time frame? 
Yes, as soon as we get this approved and go through the process, we're going to start immediately and it has a six month duration. Thank you. Larry, this is uh, funded through more Marta, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? I can just say that this is certainly an important project and an exciting project. So uh, uh, we look forward to seeing you take the next next step forward. Uh, yes, sir. Are, Us too. <laughs> are there any other questions for Mr. Prescott? If not, I'll uh, call the question. Are there any no votes? Are there any abstentions? Uh, the resolution for the contract passes. Uh, the fourth item is a briefing uh, by uh, uh, there's a briefing for the new uh, bus work, uh, the new bus network uh, uh, redesign, and it's uh, being uh, led by Jarrett Walker and Michelle Hoyero will uh, will lead the presentation. And Michelle, uh, help me out if I mispronounced your last name. Actually, you you did a wonderful job on my last name. Thank you for the introduction. Okay. Floor is uh, yours. All right. Well, thank you, Chairman Floyd, Mayor Pond, members of the committee, and, and Mr. Parker. I'm happy to be here with you this morning uh, or this afternoon. Can you hear me okay on my mic? Very well. Great. I'm going to take you through a presentation uh, about the bus network redesign that we're just commencing um, with MARTA and with MARTA's jurisdictional partners. Um, and uh, just a little bit about us. Our firm, Jarrett Walker and Associates, we are a transit planning firm, but we specialize only in bus network design and service design. So there are so many other interesting types of work that you can do in transit planning, but this is our specialty. Um, we've redesigned major transit networks for your peers, like most uh, perhaps best known for Houston Metro redesign in 2015, but also Indianapolis, Richmond, Virginia, Sacramento, California, Columbus, Ohio, and lots of other different kinds of places like Anchorage and Moscow and Reykjavik. And um, so we, we have a lot of knowledge, not just about technically how to design a good bus network, but also how this process can succeed because it is an inherently social, political, and in some ways moral process. And that's where board members are so crucial to the process because you are the ones who make the policy decisions that really uh, reflect the values of your community. And so for that reason, we will be coming back to you and asking you to make some hard choices. So that's, that's sort of my focus is um, what are the tough choices? What is going to come to the board? Uh, and therefore, what do you need to understand and be prepared for? All right, uh, next slide, please. So why fixed route transit? There's some great technology out there that has made demand response services like uh, Uber and Lyft, um, even taxis, uh, uh, flex service, microtransit that have made those much better in the last 20 years. Now, thanks to smartphones and satellites, you have a lot more information about where your ride is. But why continue to use fixed route transit? Next slide. The basic reason is space. We just don't have enough space in our cities to have everybody show up if they're in a small vehicle, whether that small vehicle is theirs or someone else's, whether it's driven or non-driven you know, by driven by a robot, there's just not enough space for people to come in their own small vehicle. If we're getting into dense places and people want to be close to each other, they have to be in a big transit vehicle, like a bus or a train, or on foot or on bikes. And while, yes, we're all home, or a lot of us are home right now because of the pandemic, in the long run, people get close to each other so that they can share ideas, do business, meet, marry, worship, do all the things that humans really just want to be close to one another to do. So ultimately, to make use of the space we've got, we are going to have to have fixed route transit, and that means a good bus network. As we work on this project, we are going to continue bringing you a concept that is access. And I want to define the word access as we'll use it here. Next slide, please. Expanding access is how a network design can expand ridership. Think of access as the wall around someone's life. Access is how far you can go in a reasonable amount of time by transit. And most importantly, what is in that space? What can you reach in that space? Next slide. 
this is showing the access for someone who say lives on Cascade Road. So this person, she can get this far, the pink area in an hour. That is the space. And the, by the way, the blue lines in the background are your transit network. So she can get pretty far. She can get to Sandy Springs. She can get to Decatur. She can get down to the airport. And that's where she can apply for jobs, sign up for school, put her kid for daycare, visit her mother, whatever. That's the access that she is provided by the MARTA network within an hour. Now, everyone has a different amount of time they're willing to travel and therefore a different amount of access from transit. But it's very helpful to look at how far people can get before we focus on exactly exactly what are they riding? Are they riding a bus? Are they riding a train? You know, just this is this is the good that transit delivers is access to a place and its opportunities. So within a fixed budget, within a limited budget, how do you expand access for more people? Next slide, please. Well, the way you expand access is you run high frequency lines so people spend less time waiting and more time getting where they're going. You need to design those to form a connected network so people can ride not only the line that goes past their home, but also other lines that go to other places. Those lines need to be reasonably fast and reliable. And then you focus those lines on places that are dense, walkable, linear, and proximate. Those are the land use patterns that allow you to maximize access within a limited budget. And dense is a very important part of that. Density is how you maximize access for lots of people instead of some people. You can make these blobs that I'm showing on this map really big for people anywhere, including in low density neighborhoods. But if you do that, you aren't increasing access for a large number of people. The way you maximize access and therefore your ridership potential is to focus access improvements in dense places because that's where most of your potential riders are. Next slide. Why frequency? High frequency means public transit is coming soon. Frequency has three independent benefits. One, you spend less time waiting. That means more time being where you wanna be. Two, you make easier connections between lines because if you get off one bus and the next bus comes once an hour, how long are you gonna wait? If you're lucky, a few minutes. If you're unlucky, 59 minutes, right? So transferring between two frequent lines is reliable and short all the time. And third, reduced impact of disruptions. If something happens to your bus, there's a breakdown, there's you know major traffic jam, another one is shortly behind it. Next slide, please. Frequency is hard to, oops, we're one behind. Next slide, please. Frequency is hard to explain to someone who doesn't use transit much. Um, you know, if we mostly your life experience is that you, when you want to go, you get in your car or you get on your bike or you walk out the door, you really are, are in charge of your own schedule and you're in charge of your own departure time. Um, so maybe think about like a really slow elevator in a building, tall building, or a long, long, long traffic signal. But there's really no parallel in our lives if we don't rely on transit for what it's like to live on poor frequency. Next, please. The best metaphor I can think of is imagine that there is a gate at the end of your driveway and it only opens once an hour. So that means if you need to be at work at 8 a.m. and you know that gate opens at a certain time and it, when you get out of that gate in your car and drive to work, you're gonna be late to work. Well, that actually means you have to leave you have to leave an hour earlier than you want to. And you have to get to work really early because that's what, that's what the gate dictates. The gate dictates when you get to leave. So it dictates when you get to arrive places and you end up spending a lot of your time waiting and not being free to go about your life at the times that really work for you. This is why frequency, this is intuitively why we know that frequency would have such a big impact on ridership, but we can also see it in the data. Next slide, please. This is a plot of all the bus routes from about 25 American uh, ag transit agencies. Every dot here is a bus route. And the dots that are more to the left are routes that are more frequent. And the dots that are higher up are routes that are more productive. So they don't just have more ridership, they have more ridership relative to the cost of the route. And you can see that there's this upward curve. More frequent routes are likely to be more productive on average. So we can see in the data that frequency is part of a high ridership, high productivity strategy. This is nationwide data, uh, but on the next slide, please, you'll see the data for 
MARTA. This is your fall 2019 route by route data, and you see the same pattern. Your more frequent routes are, on average, quite a bit more productive than your less frequent routes. This is partly because people are responding to the frequency, but it's also because your planners recognize where ridership potential is high and they invest more frequency there, and they get a disproportionately good payoff in ridership terms. So where do you have a frequent network? Um, the frequent network you have is biggest during rush hours on weekdays, but it really dwindles at other times. Um, so I'm just going to run through a couple of slides here. You can watch the frequent network get smaller through the week. Next slide. This is weekday rush hour. Next slide. Weekday midday and evening to an extent. Next slide. Weekday night. Next slide. This is Saturday midday and Sunday midday looks a lot like this. And next slide, this is Saturday night. So look at how few, oh, I should have said from the beginning, the red lines are the frequent lines. Look at how few red lines are left on the map. And really even at weekday midday, not that many red lines. Your frequent network is biggest at rush hour, but the all week frequent network is quite, quite small, quite minimal for, uh, for a region as urbanized as your region. Now, why does frequency matter again? One reason is connections. Next slide. To grow freedom, to grow access in a network design, we will make connections easy. And there's two big ways we do this. One of them um, has to do with frequency and the other has to do with just designing for connections among poorer frequency routes. One of the issues we see in your existing network that makes travel difficult um, is that it's hard to travel between, I, I want to call, I wanted to describe your system as having quadrants because you have a north-south rail line and you have an east-west rail line. And then the, the, you have basically four quadrants in between those lines. And it's quite difficult to travel by transit between those quadrants, almost as though the rail lines were walls in the network. There are very few routes that go past a rail line. So, for example, I'll just take one quadrant to quadrant trip. Next slide. This is a network map. The route colors are uh, standing, showing frequency. So light blues are 60 and 40 minute frequencies. Those are long waits. The dark blues are 30 minute frequencies. And the red lines are 15 minute frequencies, so short waits. So this is showing um, DeKalb County, and then we've got part, south, part of DeKalb south of the rail line and then part of DeKalb north of the rail line. The rail line is that gray thick line that goes through the Decatur in the middle. And this is just one example. I could take an example from any part of the network, but it's you know to travel from one quadrant of your network here from the south to the north, next slide, You wait for a bus that's probably an infrequent lines. So you're waiting a long time. You ride to a rail station. Your bus route ends there. You wait again for another infrequent bus line and you ride again. So to at least two week waits. And this is the case from any almost any quadrant to almost any other quadrant of your system is you have at least two waits to make the trip. But actually, next slide. For most trips, you actually have three waits because you're not going from you know, you're not necessarily getting dropped off at the train transit station at the rail station where your next bus route is. So you probably wait, ride, get off at the train station, ride the train, get off again, wait again, ride the next bus route. The problem with this is that these waits tend to be long because these routes are not frequent. These are not mostly not red lines and purple lines. And so that waiting time really adds up. A one way trip, someone could easily spend an hour just waiting, not even riding. Next slide. So I wanna to return to your frequent network. This is your all day frequent network uh, on weekdays. And the red lines again are the frequent lines. This is both rail and bus. And the places where these lines connect is where your frequent bus or, or rail connections are happening today. Next slide. So they're circled in yellow. This is where it's very easy for people to make a transfer from rail to bus or from bus to bus. And there just aren't that many places um, in your network where that can be done. And the thing is, frequency is expensive. That's why you don't have a big frequent network. And so if you want a big frequent network where more of these frequent to frequent transfers can take place, 
we will have to design you a network with more frequency in it, and that means less coverage. That means consolidating your service into fewer lines so that more of them can come frequently. And that is a really tough thing to do. That is a tough trade-off, and that is what's going to come before you later this year. Now, frequency is not the only way to make good connections to, to solve this, this problem I'm describing of difficult travel. Uh, between quadrants and between places uh, within frequent routes. You can also time infrequent routes to make good transfers. Next slide, please. There's something called a timed transfer or a pulse. It is not possible everywhere, um, but in certain places, we can actually design routes to come together, even if they only come once an hour, but we can design them to come together in the same place once an hour and sit together so that people can transfer among them and then they go off together. And we think this will be useful in certain places around the network. Next slide. For example, just to stay in the same part of the region I was looking at around Decatur, we have a lot of routes coming into every station. Every station has some routes. Almost all of these routes are infrequent during their, in their all week pattern. And that means transfers among them require a long wait. You ride in on a route that comes every 30 minutes, you wait for a route coming every 60 minutes, your average wait time right there at the station is gonna be 30 minutes for that transfer. So not a lot of people use your system this way. Not a lot of people transfer from bus to bus because it's just such a long wait. There is some potential here um, to make some timed transfers happen. So now I just want to touch on the major policy choices in front of you. Next slide. Here's a big one. What degree of change should be considered in this network redesign? We, at the direction of your staff, we are going to show you a big degree of change so that you can think about it. We, starting next week, are getting together with planners from um, all of your jurisdictional partners, and we are going to design two alternative concepts that are very different from your existing network. And that will help you see the degree of change that's possible. But of course, the direction of change will depend on your goals and what policy you want the new network to, to follow. So we'll design one very different network that increases uh, or maintains all of your existing coverage, keeps service in all the areas you're in today. And we'll design another very different alternative that increases frequencies and increases ridership potential but does not keep service in all the places that you're in today. And you'll see this big degree of change, but you'll also see the two different directions that you could change. Next slide. The other policy choice is how much of your bus budget should be allocated to high ridership service and how much should be reserved for providing coverage. Those two alternatives will help you see the ends of a spectrum. And your guidance to us can be somewhere on that spectrum. Maybe one of the alternatives is just right. And you tell us that's it, refine that, make that the network plan. Maybe you tell us somewhere in the middle. But this trade-off is unavoidable. And what the, the process we've set up here is a way of your giving your staff in this redesign, but also for years to come, giving your staff clear direction about how to make this trade-off because it's made in the background. It's made tacitly, even if it's not made explicitly. And so this is an opportunity to make it explicitly so that MARTA staff have clear direction about how to make it in service design. So this is the major policy choice we expect to bring to you this summer. And that can happen at one or more board meetings. It could happen at your retreat. I don't think there are any final decisions about exactly when, but we are planning to come to you with this policy choice, as well as with uh, you know more technical information, the alternatives for your review, and a whole bunch of public input on this question and on related questions. Next slide. Your existing balance, just to give you kind of a, a sense of, of scale here, the existing balance in your existing bus budget is that about 65% of service is spent uh, pursuing high ridership and about 30% of service is spent providing coverage in places where the coverage is important and it's valued, but it isn't getting high ridership and it isn't ever likely to. Next slide. If you direct us to design for higher ridership, what we will do is we will design for greater access. We will make these blobs bigger so that people can get more places. And that is how network design supports higher ridership. But really, really important point. Next slide. We won't make this, these blobs bigger for everyone everywhere. We will make them bigger, especially in the places with the most residents and the most jobs. 
if you tell us you want a higher ridership network, then we will focus on increasing access where you have the most residents and the most jobs, the most potential riders. A higher access, higher ridership network within a limited budget does not make transit better for everyone. And this is why this is so difficult. It, it, there's no way to make this uncontroversial because some people will be affected if you want to move to a higher ridership network. So there are some other policy choices for you to be aware of. Next slide. Once we know the way you want us to balance these goals in the network redesign, um, there are some other design choices and you'll get a chance to contemplate these as well. For example, next slide. Should service be shifted away from rush hours to more all day, all week patterns? Uh, one of the reasons that we will want to explore this is that the cities that have maintained or grown their ridership over the last decade are the cities that have invested in the all day, all week pattern, not in rush hours especially weekend service has been very powerful in those cities. Um, also, the pandemic certainly suggests a rethinking of the daily pattern of service. Next slide. Should stops be spaced more widely in walkable places? This would have the effect of speeding up your service, making your service more cost effective to deliver, and of course, giving people faster rides, but would require some people to walk farther. Next slide. Should routes be spaced farther apart in walkable areas so that you can offer better frequency? This is relevant in the older, denser parts of the region where there's a very connected street grid. If you have a lot of parallel routes and they're not frequent, you could run fewer of them and make them more frequent. That actually speeds up people's overall trips, but again, it does require people to walk further. Next slide. Should routes be more direct with fewer deviations? And I put these on a little scale from more to less controversial. The truth is every bus network redesign is controversial, even if you don't make any changes about these particular choices. Uh, bus network redesigns are controversial in direct proportion to how much they change and how ambitious they are. Um, but I don't want to hide from you that these are, these are choices that have impacts on people's lives and there is no technically correct answer. Um, and also they all come with their own, uh, their own difficult difficulty, their own controversy among your existing riders, no matter how great the new, the new redesign is. So in conclusion, um, please read our choices report. It's going to be finalized in just a couple of days. If you want a copy, you can request it from Tyreen Huff. It is a picture book. Um, every single slide has pictures on it. So it's a quick read. Uh, and our, we've written it for a general audience. We've written it for you, and we've also written it for your stakeholders. Um, so it's not a very technical document. So hopefully you'll have, um, you'll be interested in that and read that soon. And then finally, I do wanna tell you where we are in our timeline. Um, we are uh, right there where the first purple arrow is. We're just going to establish the alternatives um, starting on Monday with your jurisdictional partners. And then we'll be taking those out to the public to get their input. We will bring that public input to you in the summer. Um, we can ask you for policy guidance at your retreat. That's what has been discussed. Um, and perhaps over a series of board meetings as you prefer, but that we will be bringing that to you in the summer. Uh, forward one slide, please. Next slide, okay. And then uh, that's it. So thank you very much. Happy to take any questions you have. And I look forward to working with you more on this as the year goes by. Thank you, Michelle. A great briefing. Uh, are there any questions for Michelle? This is exciting. Thank you. Yeah, Michelle, this is Rod Frierson. Uh, great, great presentation. Great. I mean, it really does help me understand the trade off that we're going to have to decide and where we're going to have to find that, that place where we can be able to satisfy what needs to be done for the public as well as for uh, transportation. But my question is, how do you uh, how do you take into account the people who, who travel on short distances on the mm -hmm. bus line? Uh, because maybe everybody doesn't want to go to the connections to go up north. They just want to travel from where they live to the space where they want to either shop or they want to just be entertained. Those short distances. How do how does that come into this plan of having uh, uh, bus routes available in those communities? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I'll share two thoughts about that. For what, first, if you want to attract more riders for short trips, it is important. Then frequency becomes even more important. So if you imagine that someone, they're just riding down the road, they're, they're at no. their house, right? They want to go to the CVS. They're only going to spend seven minutes on the bus. 
Um, so if that bus only comes once an hour, not a lot of people are going to wait for it, you know, to go seven minutes down the road. Um, now, seniors will wait for it. They'll plan their trip around it. Um, people who have a lot of time and a lot of flexibility in their day will be okay with that. But people who are in a hurry or maybe who are not going to the CVS, but or they work at the CVS, they have to be there at a certain time. They're not in control of their own schedule. Those people are not going to go a short distance on a bus that comes once an hour. Um, basically, the longer the trip someone's making, the worse the frequency they'll still find attractive because the alternatives are worse. So for short trips, frequency is really important to making transit more useful to more people. Um, also, yeah, I don't, I sh I, I don't want to give the impression that when we are looking at these blobs of access, that we're just obsessed with getting people farther, farther, farther. Um, because actually a lot of the good that can be done in a network redesign is just making those local trips within a neighborhood or within a part of the region more, more useful to more people. And, um, and so that is, that can be about frequency. It can also be about offering more time connections. So even if we're not talking about a frequent network, you know, someone's, someone's trip across the rail line doesn't involve that long wait. It might be a pretty short trip. Um, so yeah, we are definitely, we will definitely be looking at success, you know, making transit successful, even just within communities, as well as for these bigger, bigger trips, you know, from one county to another or all the way to downtown. Yes. Thank you, uh, thank you for pointing that out. Any other questions for Michelle? Hi, yes, Michelle, this is Rita Scott. First, I'd like to say I really appreciate your energy. It made the um, presentation very exciting. And I'd like to confirm, maybe to make sure I heard correctly, the process you will be working with the jurisdiction, our jurisdictional partners on the network, correct? Correct. So each jurisdiction will have someone that they will have work with you and bring issues from each jurisdiction that they think will be important to the network redesign. That's right. Yes, we actually are starting that work on Monday. We are uh, normally we would do this in person, uh, but because of the pandemic, we'll do it over, uh, you know, in virtually. But we have invited all of your jurisdictional partners to join us over two weeks for a half day each day. And we will be drawing on the screen the two network alternatives. We're going to draw a high ridership concept and we're going to draw a high coverage concept. We're actually drawing the routes through every community and the, the planners from each jurisdiction have been invited and almost all of them have said yes to sit with us as we do that work and have opinions about where the route needs to be or what the right frequency is, um, as well as offer their insights about what's possible, you know, just operationally or where there's likely to be a lot of ridership. So we're getting their, we're getting their opinions as we do the work and that starts on Monday. Thank you. Yeah. M Michelle, this is Jeff Parker. I think it's, I, I think it's both our jurisdictions as well as planners from the cities within the jurisdictions as well. Is that, that sound right? Yes, cities, counties, of course, MARTA staff, MARTA planners, uh, and I believe also some regional partners like ARC. Hey, Michelle, this is Chris Tomlinson. Uh, does that list include um, uh, planners at the ATL? Um, I, I will have to check, probably. Yes. Oh, hey, Heather. All right. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> and then uh, one question and don't infer our preference in this question. Um, do your uh, partners also include the CIDs or are you focusing right now truly on the jurisdictions, i.e. the counties and cities? For this first exercise, we're focusing on the public agents, totally public agencies. Um, but there is the next round is to include the CIDs and more, more, you know, those agents, those organizations that are maybe more quasi public or um, as well as major, major organizations and nonprofits that are major stakeholders in your service. That's the next round. And so um, very soon after we're done working with the public agencies, we'll be engaging the CIDs and other organizations like them, major universities, um, advocacy groups, those types of organizations. 
All right, great. And I, I echo excellent presentation. I think you did an excellent job of laying out some of the realities and balancing tough balancing decisions that come at, at the end, but um, uh, great work. Thank you. I appreciate that. Any other questions from Michelle? Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's Bill Floyd. Go ahead, Bill. A uh, couple of things. One is, Michelle, you, you did a great job, but I, I want to emphasize, I think, <clears throat> the uh, how hard this is to do in the end. And and I think uh, I think the board needs to understand those who've been on there a while. I think understand it much more so than I do about what's involved in changing a bus route. One simple moving a bus over two blocks is an enormous task that involves tremendous problems and decisions. And so I don't want to I don't want to leave this meeting this morning with anybody thinking, well, yeah, we're going to get down to the end and there's going to be two choices and we're going to vote A or B. I don't see that as a solution. So I guess I'm asking you, I mean, when you change one bus route, it's an enormous problem. A situation requires a lot of public meetings, requires a lot of decisions, requires a, a pol political so a solution or a political answer in some sometimes rather than a administrative thing. So I think I'm, I, I want to make sure you make these, make us understand what we're getting into here, what's about to happen, the complexity of it. And also as a back end of that, what's involved, how do you decide what works and what doesn't work? If, if we make a decision to do X and we put a bus line out there and it doesn't, it doesn't get the ridership that it deserves, how do we adjust that under your scenario, if you will? So mm -hmm. I know that's a lot of a lot of questions, but and the main emphasis I have here is this is this is hard. Changing bus routes is a difficult situation politically and administratively. Yeah. And so that's what I want to make sure we understand as we move forward with it. Yeah. Thank you. Let me address your questions in reverse order. So in terms of deciding what to adjust, so we're going to make these two concepts, contrasting concepts, but a lot of the good ideas from all your partners with the cities and counties and your own staff are going to be in one or both concepts. Then we'll do public engagement, we'll come back to you and ask you for policy guidance. We'll ask you, okay, if these two concepts are the ends of the spectrum, where do you want the draft network plan to be? on the spectrum and you'll tell us. We'll then go design a draft network plan. We'll take that out for public review. We'll get feedback on that. And then we'll work with MARTA staff on, on which things to change in response to that public feedback. That will then generate the final network. Then you go into implementation, which is the hardest time in terms of the board role. Um, and once you've implemented the network, there is indeed, as you say, an adjustment period. Um, it's really important not to fiddle with it right away. In fact, it's important not to fiddle with it for, for probably about four months before it's implemented. Your staff have to be allowed to just make it happen. No more fiddling. It's implemented on the ground. Then you have to not fiddle with it for a little while. But there is an adjustment. You know, that next markup period, you know, you are fixing little things, but you're also monitoring ridership it takes normally it takes about two years to see the results in terms of ridership you can there's lots of things you will adjust earlier than that running times reliability connections but in terms of are the people responding to this network the way we expected them to it takes about two years because people have habits and they don't change those habits quickly um, so that's that's maybe a little bit of information about how how you decide when to adjust and what to adjust um, in terms of how hard this is, thank you for saying that. And I think actually the best people to talk about the board role and how difficult the board role is in a network redesign are other board members. And so I want you to know that you can call on other board members from other agencies around the country to talk to you about their experience. And we can help make those connections if you want. Um, because the, the really, the, I think, I don't think I can do it quite justice. So those of you who have more experience will, will also, I'm sure have wisdom to share just like Mr. Floyd. Um, I do want to say that changing a hundred bus routes is probably not a hundred times as hard as changing one bus route because you, you know, everyone is being treated fairly 
when you change the whole network. No one is being singled out for a difficult change. But changing 100 bus routes, it might be 40 times as hard as changing one bus route. It's a lot of work and it affects a lot of people and people have built their lives around your existing system. And so it's completely understandable that people would have strong reactions when you change it. Um, I also want to mention that this is going to be very hard for your staff. This is a lot of change for staff to manage. It is not anything like the regular service changes they have. They do year in year out. It is a once in a generation type of work and amount of work and they will need support. It is not something they can handle within their regular patterns and their regular job descriptions. So it's hard for the board and it is hard for the staff to deliver. I'll leave it there. Yeah. Any other questions from Michelle? Uh, following up on Bill's comments, this is certainly going to be a very challenging project, but potentially a very re rewarding project for our communities. So, are there any other matters to come before this uh, committee meeting? If not, I'll adjourn the meeting, and uh, the next meeting will be operations and safety. Thank you, Mr. Pond. Um, I will call the operations and safety uh, meeting to order. Uh, Ms. Huff, will you call the roll, please? Yes. yes. Roberta Abdul Salam. Present. Ash. Stacy Blakely. Present. Jim Dury. Present. William Floyd. I'm here. Roger Carson. Present. Ryan Glover. Rita Hardich. Present. Russell McMurray. Al Pond. Present. Catherine Powers. Rita Scott. Present. Reginald Snyder. Christopher Tomlinson, Thomas Worthy. Present. There are nine board members present. Thank you, Ms. Huff. The first order on our uh, first item on our agenda is the approval of the February 25th, 2021 Operations and Safety Committee meeting minutes. I'll move it. Second. This is the second card. It has been properly moved and seconded. Um, any discussion? We'll call the question. Are there any no votes? Any abstentions? It approval passes unanimously. The second item on the agenda is a resolution authorizing the award of a contract for the procurement of eligibility assessment services for mortar mobility. RFP P four six five eight six six. Um, it is very small on my phone screen, so if I got that number incorrect, please connect. Uh, correct me, uh, Mr. Stripling. But we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, and good morning, uh, Chairman Worthy, Madam Vice Chair, Ms. Abdul Salam. Members of the Operations and Safety Committee, Mr. Parker and Mr. Greenwood. The Office of Mobility Service is seeking your approval to authorize the award of a contract for procurement of eligibility assessment services for Martyrs Mobility Operation, and that is contract number P46866. Next slide, please. The following is a brief overview of the eligibility assessment process. Under the FTA's ADA regulations, paratransit service must be provided to eligible individuals whose disabilities prevent them from using the regular fixed route bus or rail system. As such, the purpose of this contract will be to partner with TransDev to provide support to the authority and our ability to objectively determine customer eligibility based on industry standards in accordance with FTA regulations and MARTA guidelines. In 2016, the authority contracted with MTM, which is Medical Transportation Management, to provide these services. During the contract's base three-year term, the contractor processed 
an average of 3,300 assessments per year. Note that the option years one and two were anomalies due to the impact of the COVID uh, shutdown and the inability to assess customers for a period of time and the limitations of customer availability uh, to come into the mobility center for their assessments. Next slide, please. The authority will retain the responsibility for direct administration of the application process for new and recertifying mobility clients. MARTA staff will continue to process incoming applications, create and maintain customer records, uh, schedule customers for their assessments with the contractor and issue the eligibility determinations to all applicants within the federally mandated 21 calendar days. The uh, proposed contractor will support the authority's efforts to consistently provide excellence in customer service and objectivity by providing comprehensive eligibility assessment services to the authority and their customers. Those services include in-person interviews of the applicants, functional assessments, and or cognitive assessments as required. Additionally, the, the uh, contractor will provide daily, weekly, and monthly reports of their findings to MARTA mobility staff to support eligibility determinations of the FTA reporting. And they will provide support and documentation throughout the eligibility appeals process as required. Next slide, please. The proposed uh, contractor is TransDeb. Uh, they are a global organization that offers a variety of public and private transportation solutions. Specific uh, to the authority's needs, TransDev has over 20 years of experience providing eligibility assessment services to agencies similar in size to MARTA or larger. And on the right of your screen, there are uh, seven of the assessment contracts that they're currently operating. Uh, one of those contracts is dated all the way back to uh, 1979. So they've got a, a, an abundance of experience in this arena. Next slide, please. During this, its evaluation of proponents' qualifications, the Source Evaluation Committee has highlighted the following value that TransDev will bring to this contract. As a com complement to the experience that TransDev has in providing paratransit services, the proposed project manager has over 15 years of experience managing the eligibility assessment process and she was instrumental in the development of the data management software application that will be used in TransDev's administration of MARTA's process. This will help to provide a seamless transition for our customers and a short learning curve for staff. The data management platform will automate several steps within the current process. Notably, it will enhance the online application process for our customers that MARTA has implemented this past December. Next slide, please. TransDev's approach and the technology that they will deploy during this contract will benefit our customers and the authority. The automated process will allow for a more efficient application, submittal and tracking process, and it will cut down on some of the manual steps in the process, which in turn means that the overall timeline from initial application submittal to the customer receiving their certification to ride will be much shorter. Likewise, the added automation will increase the authority's capacity to process more customers within the proposed staffing levels that will be provided under the contract. Next slide, please. This RSP was uh, advertised um, beginning in November 20. Uh, 2020 and the bid closed on February the 8th, 2021. There were three providers uh, for the contract with IPS links, uh, medical transportation management, the current provider and TransDev uh, Services Incorporated. The SEC has determined that it would be in the authority's best interest to enter into negotiations with TransDev. The price has been determined to be fair and reasonable based on the independent cost estimates. 
Diversity and inclusion has set a DBA goal of 25%. The actual proposed goal that the contractor uh, is submitting is 39.08% with a projected cost of 1 million uh, this contract will be for five years. This includes a three-year base term at an estimated cost of $1,552,177.75 and two one-year option years with a projected total of $1,134,547.48. This contract will utilize local funding and the proponent's bid price is $2,707,431.65. Next slide, please. Mr. Chair, I respectfully return this matter back to you for consideration. I'll move approval, Thomas. Jim. Second, Roberta. Thank you, Mr. Durrett and Ms. Abdul Salam. Is there any discussion? I have a question, Mr. Chair. Yes, ma'am. Go right ahead. Um, I, I, I want to make sure um, that it, it's in the record. Mr. Stripling, I do believe you had an opportunity to uh, go over these uh, recommendations with the MAC committee at their last meeting. We went over um, some of the proposed changes that yes. smart mobility is uh working on we didn't discuss the specific contract items right that's what i need thank you yes ma'am any other questions from the operations and safety committee any further discussion we'll go ahead and call the question are there any no votes are there any abstentions the resolution passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Stripling. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is a briefing on the 2002 ADA court order update, and that will be from Ms. Nash, uh, Mr. Osorio, Mr. Wright, and Mr. Bruno. Well, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Worthy, Ms. Abdul Salam, Mr. Parker, Mr. Greenwood, and board members. I'm Paula Nash, the Executive Director of Diversity and Inclusion, and today I, along with a few of my colleagues, will provide an update on the ADA court order, or the Americans with Disabilities Act court order. Next slide, please. So here's the batting lineup for the presentation. We'll start with me for the history and overview of the consent order. Then we have Santiago Osario on deck. Then we will have George Wright, Peter Bruno, and we will finish up with me. Next slide, please. So the ADA court order history. Next slide. In 2001, a lawsuit was filed against MARTA by six plaintiffs on behalf of themselves and others with disabilities. The lawsuit alleged that MARTA was in violation of the ADA. This is a federal lawsuit and Judge Thomas Thrash is the district court judge on the case. As a result of this lawsuit, MARTA has been under a consent order mandating certain system-wide ADA-related requirements since December 24th, 2002. I guess you can say it's the Christmas gift that keeps on giving because there is no sunset provision or specific end date to this consent order. Next slide, please. The important thing to know about the 2002 order is that it doesn't just address martyr mobility. In fact, Martyr Mobility was a relatively small part of the original order. The order actually addresses Marta's system-wide compliance, or lack thereof, with the ADA. So there are nine distinct areas 
addressed in the order and we'll take a look at those um, in just a little bit. Uh, next slide, please. So in 2014, after both parties came to an agreement that MARTA was in compliance with some parts of the consent order, the court released MARTA from certain sections of the order and entered a modified order that primarily addresses ADA yeah, announcements really? and paratransit services. We are still operating under the 2014 modified order today. Just do the calls for Next slide, please. Now we'll take a look at the sections of the court order. So I will try to quickly take us through the non compliance of 2002 and the compliance status as of 2014. So as I mentioned earlier, in 2002, the court found MARTA was not in compliance with the ADA in nine areas, and those have some multiple subparts. But by 2014, MARTA was in compliance in many of those areas. So we're in compliance with the alternative formats, which includes our website and customer information. The website is compliant with section 508 regulations. That's part of the Rehabilitation Act and basically means that individuals with vision disabilities can use our website. But also, if you've looked at Marta's website lately, you will find that it's full of necessary and valuable information for our disabled patrons. One example is it, it has information on elevator outages. Our customer information in this uh, section of the court order refers to providing materials in Braille, CDs, or other formats for our disabled customers. And we were in compliance with that. So wheelchair access address aspects of the lifts and ramps on our fixed route buses. And it also address door failures on our trains. And as you see, we were in compliance in 2014 in all except for one area, and that's the use of wheelchair lifts and ramps on fixed route. What this section provides is that if a patron requests that the operator lower the ramp, the operator can't question the patron regarding the dis regarding their disabilities. Um, that section also addresses the process for when the ramp breaks down during service. And this will be addressed uh, further by Mr. Osario. So we were also in compliance with pickup signals. And those are flags that our disabled patrons can receive and use to make sure that they are seen and not passed up by our bus operators. Next slide, please. So, as I mentioned earlier, the ADA announcements and paratransit services were the areas where we didn't fare very well regarding compliance in 2014. So, ADA announcements are those major stops, destinations, and intersection announcements made by bus operators in our fixed route services. And they also include the station and destination announcements made by rail operators on trains. Now, we do have an automated system making announcements, but because sometimes uh, the system does not work properly, and this was an issue um, around 2013 and 2014 when, when this modification was being made, because it wasn't working properly, it wasn't taken out of the uh, consent order, and operators are currently still required to make the announcements. My colleagues will address uh, the current compliance regarding ADA announcements and paratransit a little bit later. Next slide, please. So regarding customer service, by 2014, almost all of customer service was in compliance 
including how quickly phones were answered and the amount of time um, people were kept on hold. Uh, the only area that wasn't in compliance was ADA related complaints, which requires MARTA to investigate and respond to all ADA related customer service complaints and provide a written notification of the findings and actions taken. I'm happy to say that this issue has been corrected. Customer service staff has been trained on identifying ADA complaints and they are and they are actually tracked separately from other complaints. These complaints are received, reviewed, and when necessary, investigated by the Office of Diversity and Inclusion for compliance with the consent order. And notifications are sent to the complainants. Just to kind of give you an example of uh, the number of complaints that come in, pre-COVID, we got about six, an uh, average of about 650 ADA complaints were made per quarter. Um, currently, the last quarter, I believe we had about 200 ADA complaints. So training, our, our ADA related training pro provided to bus, rail, and mobility operators, and also the training provided to our customer service personnel was found to be in compliance in 2014. Disciplinary guidelines remained in the 2014 order. That's why you see the little yellow check there. But it's not because it, we weren't in compliance, but due to the concern that if removed, that discipline for violations may become a little lax. So it was left in the order. Similarly, Monitoring and compliance refers to the monitoring of the order itself. So as long as we have an order, we are required to monitor it. So that's why that's also in yellow. And a, a little bit more about monitoring. Pursuant to the court order, monitoring must be done through three entities. One of those entities is the court monitors and the court monitors are actually the plaintiff's attorneys. Um, the second entity is Mar MARTA's Office of Diversity and Inclusion, my office, uh, which is responsible for monitoring and analyzing all ADA related complaints and issues, gathering data and tracking performance in a number of very specific areas, and compiling a quarterly compliance report for production to the court monitors and MAC committee. And we also have to regularly meet with the um, with the plaintiff's attorneys or the court monitors. The last monitoring entity is an independent third party that Marta, that MARTA contracts with. Uh, this is known as our mystery customer program. It involves patrons secretly monitoring all ADA related aspects of the systems, including customer service, mobility, rail, and bus. And they look at things such as signage, announcements, the helpfulness of our operators or um, our customer service staff. They look at attitudes, cleanliness, and many other things. So now I will turn it over to Santiago Osario. Good morning, board members. Mr. Parker, I will continue the part of the presentation. Next slide, please. As um, Paula stated earlier, uh, there was a lot of red excess in 2014. As you can see on the screen, we have worked very hard to turn those red boxes into green check marks. We do have one area that is still in the yellow, and that's the Mr. Writers. Shoppers report that she just described, and most of those uh, uh, marginal uh, are due to sometimes announcements or when an operator fails to make an announcement because of the defective equipment. But overall, it has improved and it continues to improve, and we'll continue to work that through training. Next slide. As the employees join MARTA, they receive the tools that they, you know, that is necessary to ensure that they are serving our community, our ADA community, with 
the highest level of customer service and accessibility. That requires an intense training, a lot of hours of training in various areas throughout their training process, including as to when they walk through the door during needle and as they work their way through the behind the wheel training as they prepare to serve the community when they drive the bus on the databases. As the employees progress through their career, they basically there's risk certification training process in place that makes sure that it keeps their information current and it's fresh and they understand how to utilize the equipment and how to communicate effectively with the community. Next slide, please. This one was another big red X that was at the very beginning. It was an area that we have worked very closely with bus maintenance to make sure that the equipment is fully functional and to ensure that this equipment is fully functional, there's policies that have been placed. One of them is zero tolerance. That means that there's no equipment that leaves any other facilities with the defective equipment or missing equipment to uh, for the ADA um, restraints and, and, and wheelchair ramps and, and, and make sure that the meals and, and all these other elements that are necessary are operational. As the buses leave the facility, uh, there's equipment and technology that the operators utilize to do pre-trip inspections. That technology then transmit that information to bus maintenance, and they, this information is utilized when they do the regular PM preventive maintenance programs, which is done every 6,000 miles. And also is the information that is utilized when they do the biannual inspections. Uh, operators help and support bus maintenance by making sure that they identify all the elements that are no either the, the parts on the vehicle that are not working properly by basically using technology and submitting that information so we don't miss anything on that bus when it goes and hit the street. Um, this is a process that we continue to revisit and even when there's a simple breakdown out on the street for a different subject matter we bring the vehicle back and we do a full inspection to make sure that all the elements of the securement devices and the kneeling process and anything that had to do with the ATA compliance is fully operational. Uh, with that, I am happy to um, introduce my coworker, George Wright, Deputy Chief of Rail Operations. He will talk about the ADA compliance and the status of the rail operation. Thank you. George, you may be muted. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Santiago. Good morning. Uh, next slide, please. Within the rail mode, next stop, destination, and when applicable, station elevator outage announcements are required to be made by the rail operators. The rail operators are trained extensively and provided guidance via operating rules and reference materials regarding ADA announcement requirements. Additionally, the mystery customer program reports along with rail line supervisor observations provide feedback on operator performance and the functionality of the automated train announcement system. While we're realizing a positive trend in rail operator announcement compliance, and the reliability of the automated system. Results indicate that we still have room for improvement. Next slide, please. Both operators and leadership are provided with the training and tools needed to effectively deliver ADA announcements. Ultimately, it's a matter of execution and accountability that will drive the level of compliance needed in an area that is of the utmost importance to the most vulnerable of our customers. That said, the rail team is committed to delivering certainty to our customers in this area. <clears throat> Thank you. I will now turn it over to Peter Bruno representing mobility. Peter. Uh, thank you, George. Uh, turning now to mobility operations compliance, the court order addresses two areas. There are standard policy orders we must comply with, and there are a variety of performance orders we must comply with. Uh, next slide, please. 
This table depicts the policy orders we are to comply with and their status. Compliance is enforced through a number of different areas, training manuals, customer facing documents, our contracts with providers, <laughs> standard operating procedures and technology. At the present time, we are in compliance with all of the policy orders except for one. While the no ready time change without customer agreement is an understood policy amongst our reservation agents, the training manual is being updated to provide a stronger and more consistent enforcement measure. The five minute wait beyond ready time is required through our executed contracts with MV and GTS. And the mobility oversight team enforces that compliance through random checks. The others are enforced through training, the mobility riders guide, and the trapeze path system hosted by MARTA. Uh, next slide, please. Now turning to orders related to our performance. We are in compliance with each of these. Many of these performance we track through our key performance indicator program. The on-time performance order states that MARTA will make every effort to achieve 100% on-time performance. Through our regular contractor oversight and through our recent on-time sustainment program, we have put measures in place to, to demonstrate we are making every effort. For FY21 to date, we are currently tracking at 95% on-time performance. Another important performance order is our excessive ride time. The Federal Transit Administration does not specify a threshold to achieve, but rather states agencies should limit these as much as possible. Looking at the 400 ride sample so far this fiscal year, only 0.01% were deemed excessive. Looking at um, uh, capacity denial, we average 20% or, or more at times on our spare ratio on any given day. This means that any trip, any customer that reserves a trip, that trip is served. Wheelchair securement is managed through our PM inspection program. Also very important to our customers is phone access. Our current answer time is 16 seconds well below the 122nd threshold, and our hold time is two minutes, less than half the five minute threshold. With that, I'll turn the presentation back over to Ms. Nash. Thank you. Next slide, thank you. So I'm sure you're wondering, where do we go from here? Or will this consent order ever end? As I mentioned earlier, this consent order has no specific end date. What we have to do is go back to the court and move to be released from it. So when can this happen? We believe this can happen when we can show clear and sustained compliance, uh, which will be shown through the results of monitoring by the three entities that I mentioned earlier, the court monitors, Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and the independent third party monitors. With the positive direction regarding MARTA's ADA compliance status, as, as you have heard today, it is our belief that if we can continue to show sustained compliance after we get back to full ridership, then we will be in a good position to seek relief from the court. Next slide, please. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to present this update to you. Ms. Nash, thank you so much and thank you for the, the whole team for that briefing. It was very informative um, and I think very timely. Um, I'd like to open it up to any questions uh, to Ms. Nash and her team uh, uh, that committee members may have. Any questions or comments? Just, just to thank you. Absolutely. All right, we'll move on down the agenda. Um, if you could put that back up on the screen for me, please. The next, uh, the next uh, item on the agenda is a briefing for bus transportation key performance indicators. Uh, back to Mr. Osorio.
Thank you. Thanks. Take me a second there to get unmuted. Uh, next slide, please. Good morning, Chairman Worthy, Vice Chair Adil Salam, Mr. Parker, members of the Operations and Safety Committee. Today, I will brief you on five transportation key performance indicators. Normally, you get these key performance indicators in the package. So today, I'm just going to walk through some of the five performance indicators as they will present on the screen. One will be mean distance between failures, customer complaints, bus collisions, overtime, and on-time performance. My name is Santiago Osorio. I'm the Deputy Chief of Bus Operations, and it's my pleasure to be in front of the committee to give you this briefing. Next slide, please. Mean distance between failures. This is a positive story. Bus maintenance continues to meet and exceed our goal. Bus maintenance was challenged with multiple projects this year, but yet they continue to focus on safety and maintaining our rolling stock reliable, clean, and at the highest level of state of good repair. We have a bus fleet that our customers feel very comfortable and can depend on it. And of course, this cannot be accomplished without the support of this board, Jeff, and his leadership team. Next slide, please. Complaints per 100,000 boardings. This is an area that we pay a lot of attention. We see this as our temperature check for the level of service we're providing to our customers. The call center staff do an amazing job of vetting complaints and assisting customers when they call in with concerns. But they also tell us the areas that we need to improve and we pay a lot of attention to that. So over the last year, we have seen a lot of improvement in complaints decline, as you can see on the chart. Bus transportation has several customer-centric initiatives targeted to improve the relationship with our customers and employees. Next slide, please. When it comes to bus collisions, even though we're below the goal, we continue to stay focused on safety. Thanks to the safety department, technical training, and the transportation staff that they continue to work together in keeping our employees safe and the public. Next slide, please. Bus operations overtime is an area that we will perform well against the budget. We have some years that we're not very proud of it. This is a topic and is a very important topic to Jeff and Kali. Our transportation team and maintenance management teams, they're very intentional about the uses of overtime and how they use resources. Their approach and focus on fiscal responsibility clearly shows the reduction in overtime in the last few years. As you can see, a positive trend towards the, the end of FY21 versus the first years of FY16, 17, and 18. Next slide, please. Next slide, on-time performance. As you can see, on-time performance is an area that we struggled for several years. And FY18, we were about, yes, right about the goal, but then we had a consistent decline from FY19 to FY20, and the trend continued on FY21. Next slide, please. This is sort of the picture of where we were last year, and we end up the year at 77.3, which is way below the goal. Next slide. As we got together back early in May of last year, we identified that there were some areas that were basically impacting on-time performance. And as you can see, we have issues with communications, GPS, and traffic. Uh, next slide, please. As we got together in the early summer, we uncovered a lot of the areas that we figured that we needed to get busy, and we set up a blueprint. As we started to get involved, we found out that we had a lot of issues below the surface, as you can see that on the picture. Uh, we got busy. We invited other departments and stakeholders within the, within the agency to help us solve a lot of the issues that are reflecting on the screen. And uh, next slide, please. This is the stakeholders that help us get to the goal that we are today. Uh, we use and we got involved with resourcing analysis, service planning, bus stop planning, IT, training, and radio maintenance. It was a, it's a joint effort. Uh, we have a task force that we meet every month and we discuss so the issues that we encounter on the street. And as we identify issues, we 
I push it up to the departments for resolutions and actions. Next slide, please. Because of that work that has been done in the committee and the collaboration of those departments, I'm very happy to report that early or later in the summer, we're starting to see a trend as we starting to apply the same blueprint that we put together early in the summer into all the other routes that we have in operations. And because of that, now we have a sky and passed the, the 78.5 goal, and we're enjoying the benefit of an 84.1 even up to this morning on our 7.30 call, it was reported that we were hitting an 86% on-time performance call. Next slide. This is a, this is a, just a, a snapshot of what, how the on-time performance has been improving in the last few, in the last three quarters. And it's a consistent, it's a consistent trend that is going up. And we feel very comfortable that we were sustainable, that we have a, a blueprint and a, and a path forward to maintain this goal the way customers can depend on the service and they can experience that they're uh, a more dependent service out on the street. Next slide, please. There was a study uh, done by Texas A&M uh, a couple of years, two years ago, and they selected all these agencies in front of you. Um, 10 months ago, I would not be able to put that green arrow next to MARA, but as you can see, they selected these agencies and these agencies are similar in mode of operation, ridership, and complexity in the cities that they operate. Uh, so right now, uh, as I'm very happy to see in the report that uh, MARA is one of the one, the, the one agency that is performing about the goal, and we will help continue to operate at that level. Next slide, please. So what are the next steps? We feel that we have a very sustainable path forward. We have a daily call at 7.30 in the mornings where various departments report their state of the departments and what we gathered from the customers. This is sort of the daily temperature check to see how we performed the day before. Those items are then put together and turned into action items. We also have a monthly service review that within bus operations, the departments come in and report either on equipment, customer service, performance, pull out from the lot, on-time performance on the street, customer service, complaints versus what our performance is, bus control reports on their communications and the incidents that they receive. And because of all these elements that we have in place, we feel very comfortable that we will move the ball to an 80.0% starting on fiscal year FY22. And with that, Mr. Worthy, I uh, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Osorio, for that briefing of KPIs and um, very pleased with um, the news that you shared with us. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to any of uh, committee members for questions or comments on uh, Mr. Osorio's presentation. Uh, for the chair. Yes, sir, Mr. Frierson. Great, great to see that your trend okay. has changed. It's, it's great information to see that they're I've been right here since nine fifteen. Reaching the goal that they're trying to uh, achieve. Great, great reversal on the trend. So I would say, glad to see that. Great information. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's Roberta. May I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I, I, I guess I can address this to Mr. Sorio, um, but if it's the wrong person, somebody else can help out. I just wanted to know when we get your reports like this, very comprehensive, very thorough, um, good job to all of you. Does this also include our smaller uh, vendors, uh, GTS, um, Deutsch? Does it include those numbers and those figures include them as well? So, Ms. Uh, yes, so when we do the KPIs for mobility, all that is included as a comprehensive report, yes. The okay. GTS, the, all the DBs that perform within the contractors for MB, the, the OTP goal of the customer service, all that is uh, is reported to you as, as a one goal, yes. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't think we've had OTP uh looking so good in quite a long time 
Thanks for the good news. Agreed. With that, that concludes the operations and safety agenda. Um, there is one other item uh, in your packet, information only, um, that you can look at. It's FI 2021 uh, January performance indicators. And with that, I will turn it over. I will adjourn and turn it over to the next committee me uh, meeting. Thank you, Brother Worthy. Uh, the uh, Business Management Committee order for, for uh, March 25th. This is uh, Huff. Can you call? Mr. and we cannot hear you clearly. <laughs> All right, is, is that any better? Is that better? Much better. Much better. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, much better. Okay, I'm sorry. I guess my volume wasn't turned up. Okay, so I'd like to call this business management committee meeting. Mr. Soft, you gonna call would you please call the roll? Yes. Robert Abdul Salam. Present. Robert Ash. Stacy Blakely. Present. Jim Durrett. Present. William Floyd. I'm here. Roderick Fireston. Present. Ryan Glover. Rita Hardage. Present. Russell McMurray. Al Pond. Present. Catherine Powers. Rita Scott. Present. Reginald Snyder. Christopher Tomlinson. Thomas Worthy. Present. There are nine board members present. All right. Thank you, Ms. Huff. Uh, the first item on the agenda is our approval of the February 25th Business Management Committee meeting minutes. May I get a, a, a second? Mr. Chairman, I second. Okay. Okay. All right. It's been properly moved and second. Was it properly right. moved? I need a I need a motion to move. <laughs> Start with that I, first. Mr. Chairman, I'll move I move. approval. Okay, it's been approved by Mr. Durant and second by right. Mr. Worthy. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Uh, it's been properly moved and second. Do I hear any uh, comments? Concerning the meeting minutes, I like to take a vote. Do we have any abs abstentions to the many uh, meeting minutes? Are there any objections? To hearing none, the meeting minutes have been approved. The second item on the agenda is a resolution authorizing the solicitation of proposals for the procurement of property and casualty insurance broker services. Uh, Mrs. Donna Jenkins, Director of Risk Management, you have the floor. Ms. Jenkins. Good morning, Chairman Frierson, Mr. Durrett, Mr. Srinath, Mr. Parker, and members of the committee. Do you know what services a commercial insurance broker provides to a client, and why does the authority need one? In my presentation, request to solicit for property and casualty insurance brokerage services, I'll answer those two questions. I'm Donna Jennings, the Director of Risk Management, and I have 30 years of experience in corporate and government risk management, the last 20 here at MARTA. Next slide, please. My presentation today will cover three key areas. First, I will describe the role that the insurance broker plays in the authority's risk management program. Second, I will provide a high level overview of the services provided by the broker. And finally, I'll go over several aspects of this recurring contract. At the conclusion of my presentation, I'll ask for the committee's approval to move forward with the solicitation of an RFP for services. Before I get further into my presentation, there's one item I want to touch on. Regarding the DBE aspect of the contract, while the Office of Diversity and Inclusion has not yet completed their analysis, the likely result of their review is that similar to the current contract, there will not be a DBE goal assigned on this procurement as there are a limited number of national insurance brokerage firms that have the expertise and global insurance market presence to place the specialized coverage required for our operations. 
So moving on, um, what does a commercial insurance broker actually do? A broker is a licensed individual tasked with acting as an intermediary between customers and insurance providers. I need to point out that there is an important distinction between a commercial insurance broker and a commercial insurance agent. An insurance broker represents the interests of the client who hires them, while an agent works only for one specific insurance company, like State Farm or Allstate, and can only sell products that, of that insurance company. Both provide insurance options, but only the broker provides insurance options based on research done on the insurance markets as a whole. As the authority's intermediary the, at our direction, the broker approaches many insurance carriers for quotes and compares the premiums across a variety of firms to help us obtain the best price, terms, and conditions for the, all the insurance coverage we need for our operations. The authority is a complex organization with specialized insurance needs, and to meet these needs, we require an insurance brokerage firm that can deliver excellent results and a broker that will become an integral part of our risk management team. Next slide, please. Now I will go over the services the broker provides to the authority. As we discussed, the broker acts as the authority's representative in the property and casualty insurance markets. This slide lists the policies we currently have in place. And the broker will assist us with, obtain, with evaluating options for any other types of coverage that we may need or want to obtain in the future. Next slide, please. The broker also provides additional services, including administrative services for the station rehabilitation, owner controlled liability insurance program. They issue certificates of insurance to third parties on our behalf. They provide support for our contractual risk transfer program, which is our contract review program, and provide support for reporting claims to the authority's excess insurance carriers in accordance with policy provisions. The broker also provides risk management advice and counsel on a variety of issues that arise during day-to-day -day operations. Next slide, please. Finally, I'll go over the remaining contract elements, which are term and estimated cost. As stated, this is a recurring contract, and the new contract term will be a two-year base with three one-year options Jenny. for us. I'm sorry? for a total term of five years. The estimated cost for services is $475,000 for the five-year term. So let me begin to wrap things up a little bit. At the beginning of my presentation, I asked if you knew why the authority needed the services of a commercial insurance broker. And in my presentation, um, I focused on the three areas that provide the answer to that question. First, we discussed the role the insurance broker plays in the, insur in the authority's risk management program. Second, we reviewed the services the brokerage firm provides to the authority. And finally, I outlined the main aspects of the new contract, including term, cost, and address the DBE goal. Now I respectfully request the committee's approval of this resolution. Next slide, please. Thank you for your time and attention. Dave, thank you very much, Mrs. Jennings. Uh, do we have any questions uh, concerning this presentation? Well, I'll move approval of the resolution. Okay, it's been a it's been a, it's been a, mo a motion to approve. Can I get a second? Second, Blakely. Uh, pardon me. Repeat that again. Stacy Blakely, second. Uh, Stacy Blakely has second. It's been moved and second. All right. Do we have any further discussions concerning this proposed resolution? Okay, hearing none. All those who uh, have any abstentions to the resolution, do we hear any? Do we have any objections to the resolution? Okay, hearing none, the resolution has passed. Thank you very much, Ms. Jennings. Appreciate Thank it very you. much. Thank you. All right. Well, the last item on the agenda is other matters. We have, uh, you've been sent to you in your package for your FY 2020 January financial highlights and financial performance indicators. Uh, it's for information only, please review it. And if you have any questions, uh, I'll be glad to entertain it and or the MARTA staff can do just that. Uh, hearing no other matters before this committee, uh, I would call this meeting to adjourn. Thank you everybody for attending and uh, we'll see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Have a good day everybody. All right, have a good one.